Welcome everyone, I'm Victor Purton. This is the Centre for Optimism. Fundamentally, we do this. We ask people, what makes you optimistic? Today, I had coffee with someone with whom I gave career advice five years ago, and she seems to have taken some of it and become very successful. But it called to mind when we started the Centre for Optimism, one of the first questions I was asked in my first presentation was from a, a young executive who said, look, I'm always optimistic, but I get ridiculed for my optimism. You know, and you can just imagine, you know, the, the, the old bloke um, CFO or, you know, someone else leaning forward um, to want to sound really clever by being negative, by using the but word rather than the and word. And in particular, in transformation and change, the evidence from corporations, from government, from community is 75% of change projects either fail, as in they don't work, or they don't finish. And, and that tends to be the case, you know, that sort of, oh God, if we keep it battened down, this new boss is going to go through their change management and what they want to do. And by the time it gets to the end, they'll have left and there'll be someone else in with a new project. So Jeff and Amanda and Kay and Rob have come together uh, to do more than just a dull checklist. What they've come together to do is to add the secret source to transformation and change. And that's what Dominic Barton from McKinsey would say, um, Bob Iger from Disney, Mick Farrell from ResMed, you know, the very successful medical tech company. The secret is realistic and infectiously optimistic leadership. And what Jeff and Amanda and Kay and Robert have done is come together to create a scheme, a checklist, a methodology that lets that young woman who said to me, I'm being ridiculed for being optimistic, go beyond being ridiculed and to become a successful CEO driving change in her corporation. Now that's enough from me. Welcome to everyone. I'm going to disappear from your screens and hand over to Jeff Kerbel. Thank you, Victor. What a fantastic introduction. And um, I love that story about being ridiculed, ridiculed for, uh, for optimism and moving on to, uh, to be a successful leader because re that's really the um, take out or the lesson that we want to uh, want people to take from from leading transformations is that um, you have a choice between uh, uh, trying to drive transformations um, uh, mechanically, or you you get uh, an opportunity to inspire and drive um, transformation um, with with uh, powered by optimism. So that's really what we're trying to uh, to have you leave from today that your transformation will have a better chance of being successful um, by being powered by optimism. But it's not just deluded optimism, it is um, practical optimism, it is pragmatic optimism, um, and it is realistic optimism. So uh, what I wanted to do first is uh, lead off um, with a little bit of the research that we've been doing. Um, so I will, uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, with um, uh, uh, hiding behind a PowerPoint, because I think getting to the conversation and hearing from you um, is exciting uh, for all of us. Um, but we also wanted to share our thoughts and I guess a model that we've developed where, um, where we see uh, optimism um, powering transformation uh, uh, as well. So I will um, share my screen. Uh, oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Can't seem to share my screen, Victor. Oh, hang on. Um, oh, you should be able to, let me... <gasps> I wanted to relieve you, you know, those little pings when people join, I, I never do, but you should be fine now, Jeff. Fantastic, here we go. Um, and I will share uh, that one there. There we go. So really today is about the optimist's guide to successful transformation projects in 2022 and beyond um, the 2020s, I suppose is what we could, could call it. Um, anyone that, that thinks they can uh, predict, drive or influence beyond 10 years is probably a little bit deluded. Um, you know, the, the focus needs to continue to shift. So there we go. So um, Kay has a little bit of an insight from here, which is really about why programs fail. 
Um, and so Kay, did you want to do a little bit of an introduction to, to this? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, you all know that rippling is my thing, you know, the impact I have on others is is absolutely paramount in leadership. And for this group here, um, you're all you will all have experienced or led or been part of transformation so you know how the component parts work and so this is around thinking about your behavior as a leader and and how does that impact and if you look at the reasons transformations fail they are behavioral you know so so employees just don't feel comfortable and if i say why don't you feel comfortable we know there's a gap we know there's a gap in what they know what they understand how excited they feel management behavior not supporting the change Again, behavior, inadequate resources or budgets. Now you might say that's not behavior, but it really is because it's the decisions I make. So my behavior when I face into what is required to make this happen and the decisions I make come from a conscious set of decision making. So it's really interesting that you can just put these aside and say, these are mechanical process based pieces, but actually through our lens, when you look at life optimistically, these are behaviors and conscious decisions that we make as leaders that change the orientation of the organization and the people that we're trying to help. Fantastic, and uh, uh, thanks Kay. Um, if we look at some of the other uh, insights from the research that, that we've done over the last um, uh, six or seven months, um, and we look at what's the interaction between transformations that we're all working on and the workforce, um, which is really what we're talking about, about those, those um, human elements. Um, and we ask the question, is your organization undergoing a transformation? And we look at that and no surprise, it was during COVID, um, before and during COVID, uh, affected so you know a whopping 85 percent plus of organizations were undergoing what people perceived as some sort of transformation uh, and that's huge in and of itself and really tells you the importance of really getting transformations right but also the impact if you don't get them right but then if we look at the other question that we asked which was do you see a better normal for post-covid work practices in your organization um, again uh, the, the numbers were even more frighteningly large um, well over 90% of people wanted to see, um, you know, they could see a better normal. So there was sort of an inherent optimism, even in amongst the, the pessimism of COVID. Um, and so if you put those two things together and think about, well, if people are looking for, for opportunities to, um, to be optimistic, they're looking for positive leadership, and you're undergoing a transformation, well, there's no surprise that you have a massive opportunity to positively or negatively impact the outcomes and, uh, and, and business outcomes in particular in your organization. And if we look at what people were actually looking for um, in their future business environment, um, again, th there's a couple of very large uh, human factors here, empowering leadership and more flexibility. They definitely go hand in glove. Um, uh, one would say um, a subset, but people chose to more explicitly call out flexibility um, and I think that's not a surprise. Um, many people have enjoyed uh, the opportunity to make the choice as to whether they go into the office, don't go into the office. Um, uh, although during COVID, many people didn't have a choice. But the flexibility, I think, has, has awoken many people and it's accelerated a, a number of trends that were happening around hybrid workforces even before COVID. Um, but I think if you look at the other aspects, the wellbeing focus and technology being easy to use. Um, so everyone's had to use technology during this period. Uh, and if you look at the empowering leadership, this is really about saying, can we provide flexibility? Can we provide autonomy to people? Can we provide them the technology that allows them to do their jobs and get on with it? So I think there's, there's a huge opportunity here for um, leadership to step in and to take a really positive approach to empowering their workforces and using, uh, using technology to do that. So some real um, business benefits uh, listed in here. And so from all of this, um, some of the work and thinking that we've done has evolved to uh, a, a model that we've been working on. Um, it is a work in progress, but, but this is an arrival from this research and some other thinking that we've done around a model for how do we really impact those human factors that we talked about in our business transformations um, that, uh, that result in improved or better likelihood of success and improved business outcomes. And so um, uh, we'll, we'll work through this briefly just to talk about, uh, and some of these steps, as Kay mentioned up front, 
All of these steps are familiar to everybody, I think, that's been involved in any transformation. Um, you might have your sequences slightly different. You might perceive them a little differently. But the important takeout, I guess, from what we are trying to highlight here is the role that optimistic leadership can play in each of these steps. The role that we can, um, the, the fact that we can, uh, we believe that we can um, make these steps more successful. We can improve them by providing optimistic leadership as the underpinning. Um, so, so if we start from the, uh, the top right and work our way around, if we think about the vision. Well, this is really where you have an opportunity to set the scene for any transformation, including ones that are in progress, if you want to reset. And this is about mindset. And this is about, um, uh, we'll talk about culture and, and escalating that in the leadership. But this is really, really about the words, the language, the, the, um, uh, the belief and the drive that you can inject into people by having an optimistic vision for your transformation, positioning it as something that people want to be part of, that they're inspired by, that they want to move towards um, and contribute to. And, and really, this is something where leadership in lots of, as we know, transformations um, make the mistake of thinking, I'll, I'll pretend to sponsor it, but I'm really actually delegating the responsibility and accountability for this transformation to the chief transformation officer, for example, or, um, or somebody else. And I think this is where this visible, active um, sponsorship of the very highest um, executive level is hugely important. Um, and they set the scene for how optimism will, uh, and, and injecting optimism into this vision to drive that. And, uh, and with that, um, and, and we have some things at the Centre for Optimism where we can help. But uh, Amanda, if I can let you uh, uh, pass it on to you to talk about leadership. Oh, yes, thank you, Jeff. Can everyone hear me? Good. Okay, so 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 one of the things that I think people think about when they have a transformation project is they put the leader in place, as, as Jeff said. You get the executive sponsor, you appoint appoint someone as the the magical guru of transformation, and and then that person creates a leadership team, uh, and then they're seen as the stakeholders. They're the, they're the people who are who are who are responsible for the transformation, and sometimes you might even go a bit further than that and say, okay, well you know the clients or the people who are going to use this. This, this transformation, the products of this transformation are stakeholders, but there's not a lot of thought about to how culture helps or hinders the transformation. So that's one of the reasons that we put cultural management in there, because the, the way I like to think about it is you can have this team, they can be super optimistic, they've put all the, the elements in place, and we're going to go around the wheel and talk about those. But if you don't have a culture that supports that, and, and I love Victor's vision of the, the grumpy old CEO, um, but this, this idea is that if you don't have the culture that supports that transformation in an optimistic fashion so that people are sitting around saying, oh, wow, well, this project's happening, we understand it, as Kay said, it, you know, we're educated about it, we're excited about it, we believe that it's going to succeed, then it's almost like the, the team that's trying to execute on the transformation, they have this weight on them. So, so the, the, def, the, the vision that I like to have is, you know, you can either have this weight on the team holding it back saying, yeah, it's probably going to fail because, you know, 70% of projects do, or you can have it as like a, a, a type of boat that, that helps, you know, rise it up and, and support it. And, and so I think that's where uh, when we talk about stakeholder and cultural management, optimism is really important because it's, it's, it's pervasive. It goes right across the organization and it makes everybody buy in to that to that idea uh, and Rob will talk later about engage and how you get people to that point uh, so so just think about stakeholders as not just being the people as part of the transformation but also the culture and everybody else who who is who will get the results good or bad of this transformation now I might just drop the uh, drop the slides here so you can uh, see the wonderful colleagues uh, uh, talking to their their points Shortly, oh, there we go. There we go, that's better. Rob. Yeah, well, just, just picking up on what um, Amanda was saying about the leadership. Um, now you're finding more and more in the scope of a project or a transformation project coming into question. So the old proceed, um, 
process of the current versus future state and what's in, what's out, the definer of success of the project. You have to do all those. Everyone knows that who's in this um, session today. But what we're finding now with the optimistic lens of, on leadership, you're going to have to start to look at what is the transparency scope of transformation that you're talking to. What is the trust scope that you must bring into account? Because the trust factor in leadership becomes so important. And we know trust in corporations, in government, is one of the declining values right across the world. Then you've got to look at the vulnerability scope of what you're actually trying to do here as well. And finally, from a leadership perspective as well, the authenticity scope of where, what you're trying to do with the transformation. So these are new lenses that optimism puts into the equation when you're starting to define what is the scope of this project, what's in and what's out, and how are you going to get to this future state? So that leads you into where Amanda was um, highlighting a little bit before as to where the governance process comes into effect on all of this and how you're going to operate in a governance environment. Yeah, I think it's really important that we, when you set up the program, you, you set it up in such a way that you govern it in a way that's driven from this optimistic and positive outlook rather than one of fear and uh, risk, because of course, one of the things you do to start a project is you do the risk analysis. But often it's done from a point of view of, well, what can go wrong? Let's think about all these things that can possibly go wrong with the project. And I think that it's important to use risk as an enabler, not just as a prevention strategy. So also looking at all the things that can go right. And then how do you get that full list where, okay, here's all the things that can go wrong. Let's figure out how to mitigate against that. And then here's all the things that can go right. And how do you make sure that they go right? So, so it becomes a type of, of, of enabler for success success rather than a than a doom and gloom type of list it's a it's a it's their positive enablers and when we think about the kpis for how you measure the project then optimism plays a role there too uh, and it, it's quite interesting because uh, some countries now have a happiness index a wellness index you know one of the measures is not just my gdp but it's how happy people are in the country and i think uh that when you look at transformation projects, you can look at certain indicators. And we've studied this at the Center for Optimism. So we've looked at engagement, but it's not just engagement. There's actually a need for a type of optimism KPI, um, measuring that because then you're actually you're actually checking in with it with as I said before with the various stakeholders uh, and engaging with them and understanding what makes them optimistic and you pushing that all through the lifetime and the frame of the project. Um, so that's one thing to think about as well. When you set up your project, how, how it should be monitored and measured and evaluated to assure that it remains on track, it achieves the vision and so on. And um, Kay will talk about the um, resources you need to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. That, there's an interesting lens through which to look at this. So there has been research undertaken that says this whole sense that lots of transformation fails creates a bias in people and in organisations that things are going to fail before we start. So our orientation is already in failure. And so when we're looking at the resources that it will take, we're, we're coming at it through a oh, sense rather than through a what will it take? What would it take to make this a great transformation? And moving all of the possibilities, all of the barriers and biases that we have in our heads around why this couldn't work and what possibly might be against it and why that won't give us what we need. Just opening a conversation that says no holds barred, no constraints here. What will it take to make this successful? And then working back from that. So from, from that resources, just picking up on one of the points that uh, Jeff made earlier, and that was the flexibility of the workforce. And so when you're looking at the execution um, in relation to resources, one of the big things today that the researchers uh, highlighted that in America, 54% of workers want to go back to normal. But having said that, 
up to 70% want to work from home at some time. And the Productivity Commission here highlighted that 40% um, of the workers were working from home during the COVID period and 75% said they were just as productive at home as they were at the workplace. So when you're looking at an execution phase and you go through all your old, you know, your normal standards of workshops and information flows and various things like that, you're now going to have to take into account a perception gap. And this is where the realistic and infectious optimism traits become a, such an important part of exactly what is the perception that you are dealing with with your change. So the perception of the employee, the perception of your customers and any other stakeholders that may be affected by this transition. So you can't rely on traditional execution methodology anymore. You've got to look at perception. You've got to look how you're going to empower the employee to make those decisions and optimism is a key part of empowerment and it has to be realistic because that's what the employee is expecting today and you as a leader expecting a realistic outcome as well. You've got to deliver realism to what they want to achieve but it has to be infectious because it has to feed off each other. So we're basically saying get a very strong understanding of where the perception gaps are in the execution processes. And from there, look at the employee, employee empowerment and also look at the greater participation of employees as well in the whole process. And that takes into account their social values, not only the organization's values, but the social values of the employee as well. So you're dealing in a new phase of this whole execution process of transition. So I think that really leads me into where Jeff gets to is to, if you're going through this whole process, then how are you going to evaluate the outcomes of it all? Absolutely, thanks, Rob. Look, I think this is this is one of the um, uh, uh, things that organisations do exceptionally poorly, um, particularly large organisations, is um, what some organisations call benefits realisation. Um, they don't measure the benefits realisation. You get your budget. You put in your soft soft benefits and your hard benefits into your uh, uh, into your program or into your your pitch that, that you're seeking funding for or, or even broader transformations, um, and then you proceed to execute um, and have a lot of people running around executing things, but not necessarily coming back to are we achieving what we claimed we were going to achieve. So the discipline that uh, that Amanda and uh, that sorry that that Robert talked about and Amanda talked about around governance around the measures of success around what you're seeking to achieve um, and your risk settings being optimistic risk settings saying we will embrace and manage risk not try to eliminate it um, very much sets the scene about how you execute however you also need to close that gap and measure your benefits and do it regularly so this is really about saying remember to continue to monitor and measure against the, uh, the outcomes you set out to achieve and make sure those outcomes are um, trackable and measurable. Often you'll see the outcomes and, uh, and, and with a little bit of scrutiny, you realize that it is difficult. They haven't, haven't provided specific metrics. They're nice, soft, um, fluffy, me fluffy measures, um, but not actually metrics um, to see that we're going well. So I think that's really important from the evaluation side is continue to check yourself, continue to make sure you're um, uh, measuring the level of optimism in your team, the energy, the drive that they are um, applying to your transformation, um, and also make sure you're heading in the right direction, um, that the ladder you're busily climbing is up against the right wall. Uh, and I think, um, uh, and, and with that, there's a, a really, really important component, which I think wraps up what we're talking about here, uh, which is engagement. So Kay, I'll let you uh, finish off with that. Thank you, Jeff. So if I if I look through an optimistic lens, I don't have a comms plan because a comms plan is a thing. Yeah, it's a thing that doesn't inspire anybody or make anybody feel excited. But if I do it as a feel, 
I want people to feel this transformation. I want them to feel good. I want them to feel excited. I want them to feel nervous and talk to me about it. And so if I shift my orientation from comms plan to engagement, not even engagement plan, but what is the engagement that is required? And this leaps back into leadership. And the, the beautiful comment from Irina you know, about ground up. You know, we will engage at every point in the organization if we think of it as engagement, because engagement is a is a feel, not a thing. So looking at it through and say, how how would, could, should we engage? What would that look like? What would it feel like? How do we make people feel good? Because that's what we want. And interestingly, so many times I've seen somebody say, I didn't know about this. And then someone will go, I sent you an email at 2.32 on Tuesday, as if that is the process that's going to make people go yippee and embrace what's coming. Actually, it needs to become a feel. And therefore, the leadership groups and the stakeholders need to feel it themselves and think about how do they engage others into their ripple and spread the enthusiasm and the and the optimism for what's coming. Fantastic, Kay. What a great way to finish. And uh, and really, it's an important um, uh, point and, and what we probably reinforced right up the front, which is it's the human factors that determine really the success of your transformation um, rather than the mechanical. Um, and uh, so one of the questions that you would have seen on, on our slide, um, and we do deliberately left it as a dot, 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 is um, what is optimistic leadership? So we, we have a, a view of that, but um, that is one of the things that I think as we head into q and I'd be very interested in um, some of your thoughts um, uh, as we come back to the chat towards the end. Um, but we have a number of questions uh, there on the line. And uh, I was um, wondering, um, Bernie, if you're in there, Ber Bernie Kelly has joined us from, he's chair of the Australian uh, Transformation and Turnaround Association. So, um, uh, so I'd be keen for, for him to give us his thoughts, but we might start with um, with a couple of the questions that we've got there. Um, and Victor, I'm looking through some of well, the questions are coming thick and fast, which is fantastic. Um, oh, I've got Mary Ann here, but there might be some in the chat. Who should we go with first? Uh, Bernie is there, sorry. Um, so Bernie, uh, um, we'll start with you as we uh, we, we pro sort out the, the questions. Um, from the Oz TTA, and I guess the work you've done around transformation, um, your thoughts on optimistic leadership and and the the value of the human factor in in, in transformation? Yeah, um, well, I think you probably already know that by nature, my bias is probably to be an optimistic leader. Uh, the interesting piece, and I know this um, picking up in a conversation that you and Victor were sort of asking me the other day, in so. Oh, well, Firstly, thank you very much for all the insights that have been shared. I think it's been really good uh, from, from everyone. And, and a, a build that I'm sort of thinking of on top of this, or is in this space, is actually about just all, all the different perspectives that we need to increasingly understand in, um, in this sort of complex, and complex environment. And, and that actually in some ways framing, uh, from a leadership table point of view, framing that you're open to the yeah, open to the different perspectives is a big thing for me this year. How do I actually encourage environments where the different perspectives are brought forward? Because, you know, most of our workforces, most of our leadership teams, there are a lot of other perspectives that, that also need the encouragement and the sort of uh, allow and the space created for engagement. Fantastic, Bernie. And, and that, um, I, I do like, I know it's a term that, that we use a lot in businesses, a build. But I really like the the thematic of a build that it's not an or it's an and um, yeah. and and, it, and it's a next um, and I think that's a, a really good build on that. So uh, thanks for that and thanks for your leadership of the um, Transformation Turnaround Association. We look forward to um, to more with that. Um, I might need some help here, Victor, in terms of questions. I think Mary Ann had a question or a comment um, about uh, rather than change or transformation. So Mary Ann, maybe you want to share your your question and comment. And you need to come off mute. And turn my camera on. Um, lovely to see um, you collaborating. Fantastic, um, everyone. And my comment was really more about um, getting underneath the, the construct of change and transformation in that I think sometimes we just automatically walk into what almost seems like a given that organisations are undertaking change. And rather than using that language, um, why not think about 
um, optimizing uh, projects rather than transformational projects or programs because um, I, mean, I mean, I mentioned in the uh, comment that it comes from the same Latin root, right, as optimism, to optimise. So I don't use the language of change or transformation. I think it's so, unfortunately, I think as someone was saying, um, that, you know, it's associated with failure. And oh, here we go again. And it's, um, whereas, you know, how can we be our best? How can we give our best, which is, optimizing I just think that um, that's um, a really great way to engage humans and I love the um, realism and infectious optimism combination and the feel transformation so bravo that's just it was just really a just a consideration around language that's beautiful Kay and I wonder if Kay uh, Marianne I think Kay was nodding vigorously so Kay do you want to respond because I think that really picks it up. I often know when I do a search on LinkedIn um, or in the Australian newspaper for optimism, up pops optimise. So they're very close. What do you reckon, Kate? I think it's so important, Marianne. I think our language sets our brain and the brains of those around us. So, you know, even simple phrases like if I say, but suddenly my brain says, this is a problem. And everyone around me goes, this is a problem. And in fact, if I just say, and instead, it sounds so counterintuitive, but if I just shift my language and I stop saying things like, I guess, and probably, and maybe, and perhaps if I start really shifting, then people catch that it is infectious. So if I talk about optimizing the way we do things, people don't feel like we're destroying things and things are broken and it's all awful. They feel like we're building. And I think that's just, it's so insightful, Marianne. Our language as leaders, as humans is massively important in the way we impact on others. Great, thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Now, Rod Wade, you wanted to, to pick up that, those comments of Rob Masters on people wanting um, the social environment of work, but the flexibility of still being able to work from home. Do you want to elaborate on that, Rod? Because you must be seeing that in, you know, your work. And, and for those who don't know Rod, he is rolling out COVID vaccine to millions of Americans. So he's doing great work. Thank you, Victor. And, um, and if by people you mean me, I can, I can certainly say for me, because I'm the only one of my teams who's been in the office since uh, five weeks into the pandemic back in April, 2020. So um, it is extremely lonely all day long, especially when you come from a team environment where we were physically located together. We'd been together for many years, most of us, um, anywhere from five years minimum to 25 which I have to be careful, especially for some of my female colleagues talk, talking about how long we've been together. And, um, and, and, and that camaraderie that you have. So I guess it depends on what the environment you worked in the office was uh, as to how you feel about it. But uh, yeah, what Robert shared about that 54% a number in the US about those wanting to be back in the office. I think a lot of that is, is, is driving it from a social perspective, right? Because, um, we spend so much pre-pandemic, we spend so much of our working lives together with our colleagues that when it's gone, you know, you tend to miss what was positive about those engagements and probably forget some of the less positive things. Um, but uh, I think that it does put a premium on this concept of engagement. So as a leader, the ability to uh, and it's not so much about motivation. It really is engaging to be able to get the team together. You know, we always have a standing monthly meeting with the full team, all four teams. And then, you know, I meet each week with uh, the directors individually. And then one, once a month, we have a standing leadership team meeting, right? So, so that's great. But, you know, we don't, <laughs> because of uh, privacy rules in, 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 in our business and healthcare, uh, we don't enable all of our videos for all of our employees. But then I also am not a leader who would insist that people be on video. I just want them to be comfortable. So you, you've missed that connection. Now, we've started to make up for it this last year by having people visit the office in terms of picking things up and doing, finding opportunities, going to lunches, doing some things, you know, as you ride out wave after wave and, and circumstances allow it. And that's part of engagement that I think is important. Putting yourself out there as a leader 
uh, making yourself available. Um, I lost my um, questions when I came up to speak to, 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 the, to the stage here, but I talked about those skills that are really about empathy, um, about, uh, about the ability to be thoughtful as a leader, uh, to understand more than just the work in terms of your colleagues and what they're going through, uh, whether it is COVID itself, you know, instances in their family, um, or anything. And, uh, you know, and, and within reasonable amounts of, you know, relationships, corporate relationships, having that engagement. So engagement was beautiful. I love the graphic, as Tanya said, I think, in her comments. Um, I think it's an outstanding uh, illustration of what it takes to, what you should be doing or considering doing to be that optimistic leader. So thank you very much. It was wonderful. Fantastic. Just picking up on um, what you were saying there, Rod, um, it's now emerging a lot that uh, transparency from a leadership uh, point of view, uh, the trust factor, as I said earlier, is, is right up there as well. Um, but also the vulnerability uh, aspects of people and how they can actually cope and what they're actually wanting to achieve and how they can actually address their needs to achieve that. And then the authenticity of what you're actually trying to do and bringing that into the leadership. If you're not authentic in your approach, the rest of the troops will quickly find out and they won't go along with the transition that you're trying to achieve. So you have to express your vulnerabilities in that because people have now been by themselves for so long that the interaction parts are all changing as far as the scope of people's work, workplace and outcomes are, are uh, coming through. So it's a very interesting dynamic uh, that this whole transitional period is taking now. We also, Robert and Rod, we've, we mustn't underestimate the fact that the, the incidental healing that happens when we are physically close to each other. So if I'm feeling a bit confused or a bit unsettled, someone's there to put yep. an arm around me or just to talk it through with me. Transformation at the moment has to be even more mindful of the feel because if I feel yep. those things and I come off a Zoom call and I look around and there's my cat, I'm not going to be healed in the moment or get a chance to process. So there's so much more when I think about engagement as a feel rather than a thing. It's it's so important. Thank, that's a, um, um, great sentiments and thanks, Rod. I think you kicked off a, uh, a, a great line of discussion. Um, I know Stephen uh, Menelak has been uh, sitting there. He's got a great question around um, uh, CEOs and, the, and, and leadership and, and their role. So Stephen, can I, can I get you to uh, uh, reiterate your question? You need to come off mute. Apologies and uh, hi everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I bring my perspective here in this question from both India and Australia, uh, where in India, um, the CEO almost exists in like a cult of the hero or the guru. And, and so in that context, it can be very challenging for them to create uh, an empowerment program they're supposed to be the power. <laughs> and, and, and I do think also from an Australian context, I, I think there may well be a risk of a separation between CEOs and either their board or their directors or their investors in terms of, well, how do we evaluate what the CEO as an individual is delivering to us? The more they empower others, how do we know what their contribution is? I think you guys know the answer, but I just put the question there. Thanks, Stephen. I, well, think, I, think, I'll start, oh, with, I think I'll jump and start with a point there that um, uh, I think the, the idea of the CEO as hero is, um, uh, is, is one of those things that's sort of embedded certainly in Western culture. Um, uh, the CEO as, as guru is slightly different, I think, um, in the all knowing as opposed to the all doing. Um, but I think the reality is, and anyone that's worked in a team, small, big or otherwise, realises that um, a, a wonderful saying of, of uh, those who know how work for those who know why. Um, I think the, the idea of the, the mission um, and the direction being set by the CEO and maintained and reiterated, and if you like, continuing to maintain the energy, I think we're, that, that's always been the case. But I think 
um, the, the realization of the role of the CEO and, and leadership team, in fact, um, as being enablers, but also direction setters, but not necessarily the, the knowers, but the people that ask the right questions. Um, and I think questioning in modern management and in modern environments, you know, cons consultants have always been famous for um, asking the questions because they can provide the answers. But I think the reality is good questions get good answers. And it's just a matter of letting people come up with the answers as opposed to providing them. And I think that's where the, the role of the CEO um, in these sorts of environments is really about helping people realize their potential as opposed to just directing their work ethics. And I think that's a, a, an inspiration rather than a perspiration comment. Um, but, but I'll throw it to others that might want to speak about it. Well, Jeff, what a, what a, I love that comment. I actually hadn't hadn't heard that before about uh, about the people who who do the why and the how. But uh, I, I think that what you're seeing is is very big cultural transformations in wider society that are going to be reflected back into uh, individual organisations. Um, we're seeing that now with with you know the thing about the great resignation and people have changed and do things differently. And if you like, that pyramid is starting to pull apart and flatten. Um, and that's where the culture is really changing. And I think that's being even more driven by the fact that people are working from home a lot. So, so what happens is that rather than this old fashioned, here's, here's the CEO at the top of the pyramid, and then there's a leadership team, and then there's a management team, and then there's the worker bees, and then there's everyone else who doesn't have a lot to say about it, it's just going away. It's going away because the this generation that's coming through, they just don't accept that. If they don't like it, they just walk. Um, and and also because people people do feel empowered and so that's where when I talked about stakeholder management before um, it's really important that the culture follows in fact not follows the stakeholder management it drives the stakeholder management it supports the stakeholder management everybody wants to have a say everybody wants to understand everybody wants to be engaged and it's messy it, it was much easier when you know I worked in executive and internal comms at one point in my career it's much easier when you can just shoot out that email at you know nine o'clock on Monday morning and say okay I'm done the email's gone um, but it doesn't work that way anymore you have to find you know ways to engage with people and have technology platforms to engage with people and have people being able to say yeah this project's going to work so the CEO sets the tone but it's not just the CEO anymore so that that will be challenging for certain cultures Stephen I I, I recognize that Thanks very much. Um, we've got a, a, a great um, a ponderance um, from, from Malcolm Lewis. Um, is Malcolm, oh, there he is. Um, he's, he's at the beach, um, which is a wonderful thing about flexible working at the moment, albeit it's a background. So Malcolm, did you want to share your, your thoughts and your question? Thanks, uh, Jeff, and uh, thanks, everyone. Yes, so that's only in Torquay Beach, which is about... Uh, but, but uh, uh, at the moment, no, it's about a, um, a 90 minute drive from, um, from downtown metropolitan Melbourne, maybe metropolitan Melbourne, but I get to go down there occasionally. I guess as this has started, and oh, thanks for being, being Victor, by the way, I'm a, as you can see, uh, I've been around the traps for a while. I'm actually a CFO. So, so just taking on board your, your previous comments, I'll have your glasses too. The, um, it was really started, thank you, about a question that I had um, from what I put in the Q&A was about, I, I guess, be interested in the panel's view about the opportunity for a positive paradigm shift in the fact of uh, in what's a COVID or a post-COVID environment, particularly in Australia and perhaps in other countries as well. And this there was a perception that certain tasks that we couldn't do from home, um, whilst it were, may not have been preferable, out of necessity, we just had to get things done. We just had to do those tasks. So one of the paradigm shifts that I've been involved, and I consult mainly to government, local government and not-for-profit, is a paradigm shift of what was doable from by working from home. So I guess the spin on this is what's the opportunity we have now to put a positive view on something that we've had the, the impact of COVID, obviously, and the, uh, which, which appears to be an enduring impact, but what are some of the learnings about paradigm shifts that might challenge our assumptions, and particularly one of those initial assumption that, you know, certain things, and certainly the environment that I, that I operate in, that we couldn't always work, work from home to do all the tasks, 
Um, yes, there's potentially some cultural challenges with organisations um, that if they uh, have, a, have a continual uh, period of working from home and not having that face-to-face -face contact. So there is some trade-offs, but it does generate some paradigm shifts of what was possible. And I'm just interested in panel, the panel's view around that just in the context of um, setting, a, setting that optimistic framework. I might get um, Kay to, to come in on, on that, um, but I think the point you raised, Malcolm, about um, challenge and, uh, uh, and um, opportunity and possibility, I think that in and of itself, the way we think about what's possible is the paradigm shift that we've seen over the last two years, just through, uh, you know, we are, we are a bit fat and lazy as a culture, really, as a society. We're a wealthy country. We have a lot of choice to, to not do much, and I think this removed a bit of the choice and created a bit of necessity. And that was a fantastic paradigm shift about us uh, opening up to possibilities. So uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Kay to, to get her thoughts. Thank you. And it's, that's, it's so insightful, Malcolm, thank you. I think in a world where we're struggling with the shift, we will wrap a lot of checkup into our lives, which means I ring you and I say, how's the task going? How's the deliverable going? How's that project coming together? How are you managing the risk? And in order to support the paradigm shift you've described, I'm going to take you back to feel again. And I'm really sorry to do that, but it's about the ripple. So unless I'm also able to do some check in, which has nothing to do with task or process or deliverables, it has to do with how are you? How are things going for you? What can I do to support you? Then people won't believe that they can be human and that it's okay. And if I'm able to do that check in and I'm able to go, oh my goodness, the cat was sick all over the floor this morning. Now I'm wrapping vulnerability and now I'm saying it's okay for your cat to be sick and I'm happy to hear that. And so the behavior of our leaders has to change for the paradigm to shift. So if we keep, if we keep running down the thing task, that the, the thing path where tasks are the only thing we we focus on then we'll never make the shift because people won't actually believe and then what happens and I heard it last week with a client who said um, what they discovered was somebody was leaving their their email on until six o'clock at night because that seemed to be what was expected and when you unpick that what she actually wanted to do was go and pick the kids up. She sometimes had some emergencies, but it didn't feel okay to do that. And so what happened was she anchored into pretending that there was a shift, but actually there wasn't a real shift and she didn't feel trust. And now I'm back to feel, you know, trust drives feel, feel drives trust. So I think it's got to be a blend, Malcolm, of the things we do and the way we behave as leaders create the ripple because the things I do and the decisions I make give the organisation and my teams very clear messages about what's acceptable and really what, what I want and what I think is right. Thank you. If I can just add one thing, one of the things I found stunning is the anecdotal evidence on call centres working better. Um, with the operators working from home. And, and in fact, there's some objective evidence of customer satisfaction. So um, I did um, a, a What Makes You Optimistic event for a particular organization. And, you know, not one of them, when I said, what makes you optimistic, said, you know, it's the leader or it's finishing the project. It was being in my garden. You know, it, it's, and, and, you know, so if you can do, run a call center looking at your garden, you know, getting your lunch from the fridge, Maybe you only need to go into the battery two days a week or one day a week to drink the Kool-Aid. But otherwise, you know, the call centre operator may be very happy working from her kitchen table. Excellent comment there. I'm conscious we've got a, um, a 10 minutes or so to go. Um, we've got a couple of good questions there. So I think we'll go Arena and then Wayne is patiently waiting to, to, uh, to get his question, uh, which is great. But uh, Irina, you're, uh, you seem to be back with us. Um, if you want to share your, uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, tools and so on for, for capturing relationships. We need to come off mute and to see you. Oh, Irina was there. Can I? Oh, there she is. And if you just take yourself off mute, Irina. <laughs> no, she's still on mute. There it's we go. You can hear me now. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Yeah, um, my background is in um, research, and I've developed some tools for 
mapping and modelling um, relationships between people in uh, the diffusion of technologies, in other words, the spread of new ideas, um, which seemed like they might have a fit with part of your model, which talks about the notion of um, mapping and looking at the relationships, because it seems to me that there is a bit of a hole there in addressing organisational transformation. Um, we know what all the parts are, but we don't know how they're connected. And um, if we can get a helicopter view, in other words, look down as if we're looking at a traffic system and understand how things flow and where the bottlenecks are and how then you could say, well, if that's the real situation, what would an ideal situation look like? We might have a way forward. And I guess that's my question. While in your model, you have a clear place for something like that, what have you come up with that works? I have something that works. I've researched it. I've got a PhD as a base, you know, as a result. Um, I even got the vice chancellor's medal for my PhD thesis. So, um, so I know this stuff is, there is ways of looking at things as, as long as you treat it as a problem of complexity and stop treating it as just something linear. I noticed that agile methodologies and things like that come into some of your philosophy. Um, this sort of embraces the notion of um, being able to look at things, but to look at them within context. Well, Irina, I love the fact that you started with the answer to your own question, which was what, <laughs> tools, what tools do you use to, uh, to, to map the, the relationships? Um, I, know what I, I know what I've used. I'm interested in what you've used. There are, um, so it's fair to say this is a work in progress and we haven't delved to that, that depth on the tooling. Um, I know there are a number of uh, tools that have been experimented or used in organisations by the likes of Microsoft around, uh, and others around um, uh, email sensing, language use and email and things like that. Some have a bit of a big brother feel and they, they, there are some uh, um, uh, sensitivities around how you use them and deploy them, but um, but I think it's fair to say we'll be interested, but I'd be open to anyone else's thoughts on, on the, the, the tools used to understand the relationships in a complex organisation. Um, so feel free to put up your hand if you have, have any suggestions. Otherwise, Thank Irina, you. Uh, feel free to, to, to put your, uh, your URL in the chat. Thank you. And, and I think it'd be, be great because, as we said, this is, you know, this is to be kicked around and we'll be doing another event in European time zone shortly. So, Irina, this is new. So we'd love, you know, to have your input into this you know I'm, I'm yeah, we've got John Hagel who wrote the power of pull and the like in our advisory board but you know your PhD in this area you know puts you at front and center in the expertise around analyzing those networks and the bottlenecks so you yourself put, I think are the guru in this arena I'll put my email up there if anyone's interested in contacting me okay um, Irina the the pricey model is is a model that many corporations and Which you one? a p-r-o-s-c-i model and that's <clears throat> that's used by many organizations around the world and and they is have that a, a tool is that an actual it, modeling tool it's, it's it's a modeling tool yes and it's a step-by-step -step process that takes organizations through the current state to the future state and then with Within that, they've got a, what they call a, a model, which is um, ADKAR, the ADCAR model, which measures the awareness and desire and accountability and knowledge, etc. And so they they have tools that measure each of those aspects throughout the uh, change or transitional process. Um, okay. So that, that two that you could look yeah. at, you probably have looked at, but there are two models that many corporations try to adopt. I don't know government departments uh, use the PROCI model quite, quite often um, because it's- I'm, I'm, actually talk, I'm actually talking about a, a, a way of capturing. Yep, and, and these-, these Does that that, that that's part of the underlying them. aspects of them, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's fair Thank to say you. I've seen various deployments arena of some of these tools and uh, and and been offered them by uh, any number of the big four um, and uh, nothing seems to uh, be quite as good as uh, it says on the box. So um, uh, what a shame! 
The fair, fair to say the market might be uh, might be available for you, Irina, to do that. Mine's, um, mine's free for and, anyone to use that uses agent based modelling. Okay, contact uh, contact Bernie Kelly at the uh, Centre for for Transformation and, and Turnaround <laughs> as well. Turnaround and Transformation. And um, I think the you. I think the tool doesn't work in in isolation of the behaviour and the questions that right. we ask as leaders. Right. So, so, so that's the primary piece. And then the tool is the supporting mechanical piece. So the tool is the thing, but we still have to have the behaviour. Um, and the best tool in the world gives you nothing if the questions aren't right and the leadership behaviour isn't strong. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, I reckon we can, go, we can go two minutes beyond time, I think, because Wayne Dyson, as, as we know, always has such exceptional insights. So... Jeff, do, do you want to call Wayne up? Absolutely. Wayne's Wayne's unmuted himself. He's got a, a fantastic smile ready to go and I'm sure some great questions. Wayne. Uh, look, I've got to tell you that one of the reasons I'm on here is because Kay is, because Kay's probably one of the most authentic, optimistic leaders I know. So good on you, Kay. Uh, look, I'm, I'm really interested. I've, I've had a lot to do with uh, transformation uh, and culture uh, in organisations. What really, I'm, I'm just interested in what, uh, you as, as panellists have found that works well to keep uh, accountability to any change. Um, I, I just struggle sometimes with uh, the organisation to come up with the values and they come up with the behaviours. Uh, is there any particular methodologies that have worked really well to keep an organisation accountable to the new culture that they want, the, the, you know, the direction they want to head to? I use a reverse model, Wayne. Um, so quite often when we're doing this work, we do what would it, what would good look like? And what I do is I use a reverse model, which is what, what wouldn't good look like? And so, for example, you get things like, yeah, we're all up for respect. Respect is good. I'm up for that. If you ask what it doesn't look like, somebody says, come into my meetings always late. And then you see people go, oh so what I try to do is get both sides of the consideration for us to really explore do we understand what this looks like and what it doesn't look like because what it doesn't look like is where the difference is and where the ripple is most impactful yeah. were you talking about culture Wayne or yeah. you're talking about a cultural change of an organization yeah look I think I think a lot of organizations are good at, at saying you know this is where we want to go this is what's underpinning uh, how we want to go. Uh, but then they start on that journey and there's not really good processes in place to keep accountability to say, you know what, we are on our way, it is working. Um, I just haven't seen a lot of formality in, in being able to, to measure and keep accountable to the, that new direction. Probably the best, um, best example of, uh, look, and I think that, that that's one of those classic um, it depends on what's right for your organisation kind of answers. Um, but it's fair to say uh, companies like Culture Amp, um, which, which, you know, wonderful um, um, uh, Australian startup, um, are really grappling and tackling that problem. And I think if you think about behaviour or cult culture, culture should effectively um, result in behaviour. Behaviour results in, in um, some outcome or movement. And it's, it's understanding when you do set some cultural expectations that you map what are the outcomes that should arise out of those behaviours and those are what you can track. And Bernie's got his hand up because he's uh, uh, he's uh, clearly got an answer to that. I, I just think it is a fascinating conversation and how in the change fraternity we keep falling for the trick of talking about others on this conversation. And I think all of us as aspiring transformation change leaders actually even just reflecting on habits that we find hard to follow through on and actually be accountable to ourselves is a is a it's a real practical place to go learning we um there's a lot of intellectual frameworks around this stuff but really just think about something you'd like to change yourself and as a leader holding yourself accountable there is so much learning just in that little place thank you I think that, um, and there was one question in the chat before we go to uh, to, to last words and open mic, Victor. So um, we'll go to last words next. But uh, Paul Chapman asked a question about um, uh, institutions, corporations, or business leaders that exemplify the leadership qualities and processes we're suggesting. Um, certainly, one of the one of the organisations that I've um, uh, thought does a really good job and probably ties a little bit to what Wayne's talking about culture is, uh, is one of my first employers, Mars Confectionery, and it's still owned by the, the Mars family. Um, 
uh, but, but broadly. And they use a principles-based management model um, where every, every person that joins them says, these are our five principles. Mm -hmm. And if you think you're gonna breach any of them, it's probably the wrong decision. But if you can hand on your heart, say, I meet these principles, then you can make a decision and go forward. And it's extremely empowering and it's not prescriptive and it's not task or execution oriented, but it's really about um, uh, the, the objectives you're setting and the, the principles um, that you should do business by. Um, so I think that's what really interesting um, way of getting an organization to be empowering. It still has its objectives and so on, but it really aids decision-making from a cultural perspective. It really is embedded in the organizations. Kate? The, the other thing to think about is um, if I'm if I'm really not doing a great job, comparing myself to organizations that are doing an amazing job can feel really, really hard and feel like I'll never get there. So remembering to measure yourself on your own progress too, because actually moving towards a more optimistic style will be a different journey for each organization and then celebrating the wins as you progress through keeping in mind that there are some lessons to be learned from the organizations that do it really well and the leaders that do it well but also anchor into your own steps and your own improvement thanks Kay. if i can just add one little thing jeff i'm, I'm gonna let you finish my son, my, my son goes to, to a well-known melbourne school and recently you know boys schools were getting a bad rap in australia and he sent out a newsletter which was bemoaning, you know, the general state. And I wrote back to him, in fact, I rang him and I said that the great thing about your school is you've actually got a values in action committee. And the boys are actually charged with keeping the culture. Um, and they do a really good job. And um, so again, you know, that, that notion of actually having a group of people doing it as, as um, Amanda would say, those ambassadors of optimism yeah, which we even got going in a tax department in, in, a, in a particular country. You know, so um, keeping those values and, and you know, making sure there's a group of people who are actually in charge of that, um, I think is extremely valuable. And you do see it in some organisations rather than the, the values being a chart on the wall, actually having it as, as values in action. But back to you, Jeff, because I think we should finish off the formal proceedings and then we can just gossip. Exactly. I think that's that's perfect timing there, Victor. So um, firstly, I'd like to uh, um, thank all my fellow uh, uh, members on the team um, that, that, that have sort of uh, contributing and, and continue. we continue to evolve this work, um, Robert Masters, Kay Clancy and, and Amanda Noz. Um, and also for all of you for joining um, what has been a really great, great session. One of the things that um, uh, I'm always uh, humbled and privileged to, to be involved in is um, the intellect that that we continue to attract and contribute to these things. And uh, I would encourage you to, um, uh, of course, become a member of the Centre for Optimism. I'm sure you all are. Um, but uh, continue to, to join these and contribute um, to this work as well through the surveys and the work we're doing. Um, you know, the, these, these are the times when we, uh, if anything, we're crowd, crowdsourcing may not be the right term, but where we're starting to um, find ways, tools, um, to efficiently and effectively harness um, a broad range of people's ideas and thoughts um, where the collective brain um, continue and the diversity that brings and the different ways of thinking is really helping contribute to better. And I think um, I'd like to finish with a statement around um, a change that Irina alluded to because uh, I've been involved in, in sales, marketing, um, you know, transformation, all these sorts of activities over the years and, uh, and found myself in a change management environment. And um, uh, I think there's a huge amount of iron irony around that. Um, it's not particularly expire inspiring to talk about change. Um, uh, and, and really, if you're wanting to shift people's behaviors and mindsets, um, it, inspiring language that, that, that um, touches in an em emotional way, not a mechanical way, um, uh, and actually makes things feel like they will be better, back to Kay's point about feel, um, is, is almost the direct opposite of the word change in most people's minds. So I think, you know, change management should be about better management. Um, not, you know, we should be changing for the better, not just changing uh, for change's sake. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. A fantastic session. Thank you, Victor, for, for, um, for driving the tech. Um, he is the master at this sort of thing and, and, uh, and we are absolutely the apprentices. So uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you all for attending.
and uh, enjoy the afternoon and evening uh, or morning or day as, as where you are. And uh, now we'll go to um, what uh, Victor affectionately calls Wild Mike. So uh, come off mute. And if you've got something to say, share, contribute, ask, by all means, jump in. There's a lot of richness coming out of that, Jeff, isn't there? Absolutely. And Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Malcolm. Giuseppe, the optimist, I just have to ask if we can get a, a vocal contribution from you, given that um, uh, that title is the most, uh, uh, is the most endearing of, of all the ones we've had so far. Um, Sorry, you're referring to a question. Sorry, Jeff, I missed the. Oh no, no, there's 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 a person online whose name is Giuseppe the Optimist. So I'd be love. Uh, I just wanted to hear from them, but um, uh, come off your screen if you can, and uh, and off the thing. Oh, there he is. There he is. Excellent, Giuseppe. If you want to come off mute and uh, and share uh, uh, where you're working, what you're doing, and um, and your thoughts on on optimistic leadership. Well, right now I'm um, at home, and I am just enjoying this session it's really very <laughs> inspiring to hear people that may not have all the answers but they've definitely got all the questions and they've got they've got a system a, an approach to finding the answers and um, uh, as someone who believes things get better over time um, you know, that um, that entropy may be a physics concept, but it's not a human concept. Um, I, I find the, the, the yearning and the searching really an incredible part of the journey towards you know, becoming a better person myself and everyone else is on, on their own journey, maybe on different paths, but they're all on their own journeys and, and none of them are standing still, which is fantastic. Mm. And it came up a couple of times during the session, but uh, Mindset is such a powerful tool in itself. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned it, Kay, I think uh, a few others mentioned it, but, you know, just actually having that mindset to say, hey, you know, we, we know we're going to get there. We don't know how it's going to happen. Uh, but just following on from what you're saying there, Giuseppe, it's uh, it, just to have the mindset to start with. You're, you're halfway down the road already. Indeed. Paul. Wonderful question from you, and and you know, certainly as uh, as Giuseppe said, not necessarily all the answers, but certainly a desire to start uh, to start exploring. And um, so, I'd love to hear a contribution from yourself. Um, look, to tell you the truth, I thought a lot of the conversation was very academic, um, and that will come from doing research, and that was great. You need to, we need to see and feel that for the some. Uh, the things that I took out of that were uh, particularly for one from Rob Masters and our experience is that uh, uh, quality leadership comes with trust. Um, but in an environment where that's hard to achieve, you know, we're in an engineering uh, environment where you've got uh, uh, designers, accountants in a front office, typical environment down to a factory environment. You, you can you can often find that hard to to get that trust simply because the, the people on the particularly on the floor don't aren't around those managers all the time. Uh, so we've got to convey that. I think that was a, a, a very pertinent point, Rob. I see the change management, uh, and we've been doing it for thirty five years. And your last comment about you don't know where you're going to get to. There's nothing, there's nothing surer than that. You start on a journey, but you don't know where it's coming. I think the change meant to me is very much the same as innovation. You've got to apply a level of risk and a level of belief in yourself to say, well, we're going to have a crack at this, everyone. We hope it works. We'll put things in place. Um, I, um, Kay, Amanda, I was, and Kay, I was uh, valuing your... Um, your comments around the feeling, I think that's, that is very important. And yet, very hard to do all the time. I didn't hear much about the environments where people just don't have the luxury of working from home. 
you've got to have a team. Uh, who, who was talking about team? Was it you, Rob? Yeah. You know, I know it was, um, I forget who it was now. I was oh, just talking about you've got to be at the office and talk to, have your team around you. So uh, that to me was, uh, uh, it, it resonated with me for sure. All in all, uh, I think a terrific session, valuable insights. Thanks, Paul. I think Rod talked about uh, being connected to team and working with people and, and missing them. So uh, yeah, that's absolutely, right. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that was a, a yeah. really good point. Uh, if I can just finish it, that I've had to work from home for the last 18 months. Not so much because of COVID, <laughs> because of, we ran out of room at work. <laughs> so, <laughs> the old bloke got the ass. <laughs> but it's good to go in there and, and be part of it. And that that in itself. You worry yourself whether uh, this very, very last comment about um, who raised about you know, your values. I couldn't help but say to myself, you know, I'm going to walk in this week and just ask the blokes on the factory floor and the blokes and the girls and all throughout the organisation. We've only got 40 people. But so, you know, you know, why are you here? What's, uh, what's your purpose? But you know, do you know our values? Well, I think the centre, as you know, the Centre for Optimism had the world's first shop of optimism in Middle Park and then the world's first closed shop of optimism in Middle Park because we couldn't do round tables under the meterage restrictions. But um, I'm having a meeting tomorrow and I think as of next week, we will have a physical presence in the CBD of Melbourne and we'll start moving around again. Um, so I think we'll try our best to bring people... Keep, keep using what we're doing here because, I mean, we've got the wonderful thing about Zoom is we're in France, we're in San Diego, we're in Adelaide. You know, it's an incredible thing that we can do, but getting together. So I'll move around a little bit more around the country. And then um, I was meant to be in Boston this week, but I looked at Boston and the queues for COVID testing were twice as long as Melbourne. The hospitals were jammed. And when I rang the, the guy who was organising the thing, I said, look, I, I think we might leave it till till the COVID thing's gone down a bit. He said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. But the point you make, Paul, that ability to get together and, you know, because the problem with Zoom is only one person can talk at a time. You know, when you're in the one room together, there's lots of that lovely interruption you can do. My wife doesn't think it's lovely interruption, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish my point, Jeff. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got to go. Unfortunately, I've got I've got this thing called life. I've got to take my son to soccer training. But thank you very much. I'll uh, hand it over to the, uh, the, the the more than capable team in, in Victor's hands. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Goodbye. Brilliant work, Jeff. Well done, Jeff. Uh, well, I think we'll be able to develop this a lot more, I think. I think this is um, a grand project, Kay. What do you reckon, Amanda? I think but I think let's do this again, maybe in three weeks. Similar agenda, but just, you know, as Rod said, the diagram we've got now is right. We've just got to word craft that checklist a little bit more because um, we've got your version and Rob's version. So we'll, we'll I think we'll word craft that together. Um, and look, if anyone, you know, Rod, if, if you want to join the group and Paul and, and Irena with her networking stuff, you know, we'll just, this is not a, an exclusive four person working team. You know, we, we, we will expand this and, and each of you have got wonderful insights. Now, Nathan, you haven't said anything and you're doing incredible stuff at Yarra Valley Water. We are, <laughs> we are, I suppose. Yeah, if, uh, if you're going to try and tackle the, the, the challenge of a generation, you, you need to have some optimism, I think. I think if, if, you, if you don't, you, you, you've already stuffed from the outset. Um, yeah, we've, uh, we've got such amazing opportunities in the water industry um, with respect to the, the material streams that we deal with, the scale that we deal with, and also, by the way, that what, what drives what we do. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a business case side of things to do, the, sort of the nuts and bolts of the everyday. But the thing is as well is, is that we, we have customer juries and if the customers tell us that they want to do something, effectively what they're doing is saying that we can put a little bit more in our price to experiment with things and try new things. And we've got some, we've got some really exciting projects um, working through um, at uh, Aurora. We're looking at creating green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, depending on which, which sort of way you look at it. We've got a waste to energy 
um, facility there, um, which would be powering, uh, basically splitting hydrogen atoms, uh, water atoms. Hydrogen we get out of it, we sell that to um, the transport industry. <clears throat> then the, the oxygen that we've got, we then feed that into our treatment plant, which basically will end up being a massive energy saving for us because at the moment we, threw, we put um, uh, air through it but oxygen is the only active ingredient. So we get to save a bunch of energy there. And, the, and there's a byproduct from all this too. Um, and, and one of the things and that is that we get some chlorine on the side. <laughs> well, <laughs> the water industry, yeah, we, we go through an absolute bucket load of that as well. So there are all these kind of really exciting opportunities that, that we've got and, and we've got, we're in the best position to be in the front foot to, to move all that forward. So it's, yeah, we've got other stuff. Like there's, a, there's another one where we're repurposing a... Um, repurposing a dam up at Wallen. So instead of just being an open dam, there's there's a limit to what you can store in there in terms of like what happens to the water in, in the long term. So we want to put a roof on it, but you can't, because it's so shallow, it's not economical. Put solar powered panels on it, however, and all of a sudden we've got an energy source, we've got a cover that's paying for itself. And we've also got more opportunities up there to, to do things like um, we might generate our own chlorine, we may expand into stormwater harvesting, uh, all, all sorts of things that, 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 that these kind of things, they're, 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 they're coming out and it's, it's, the, it's at the heart of it. It's, yeah, it's very exciting. It's great. And those who don't know, Nathan's to blame for my spectacles. <laughs> he, he was the one that got me going on the circular economy. <laughs> now, Lloyd, you're the only one that hasn't said anything. Well, um, yes, I'm not sure uh, where I fit in. Do you? You only seem to have four other people that aren't on screen. Um, so, how many participants do you have all together? Well, I don't know, Lloyd, but just we're asking you. Just you talk. <laughs> well, I'm not in business anymore, so a lot of that stuff I can't apply directly. Uh, I certainly, I, I like some of the concepts that you're espousing. That is very inspirational. And I, it's nice to know that businesses are thinking along those lines of optimism and, and more caring for their staff and the people that they deal with. And, and you're very active in Rotary. So I'm, I'm one of the keynote speakers at the District Rotary Conference in March, which I think will be physical at the Caulfield Racetrack. Um, but I mean, Rotary is an interesting organisation, Lloyd, because it's aged so rapidly in the last 30 years. You know, it used to be a young man's organisation. Yeah, the trouble now is that we, we do, in, in my club in Kew, we do have a majority of oldies like me, uh, not many as old as I, but when we don't have enough females, we have a couple of very active and inspirational young females, which is good couple or three, uh, we need more. Well, listen, guys, what do you reckon? We've been on air for an hour and, and 25 minutes. So, but I think this is, my feeling is that, that Kay and Robert and, and Jeff and Amanda um, have really hit upon something really, really important. And Rod, you've been very kind. I think we'll continue to refine that diagram, um, the checklist for reform, and as Paul said, you know, that very practical side of things, you know, and, and Amanda, for instance, with her idea of the ambassadors of optimism, you know, there's a large corporation, you know, in France that's talking to her about that stuff. Um, you know, and Nathan is an ambassador himself, as are you, Rod, and, and, and Paul and Lloyd and Kay. So, but, so we'll keep going with this. I think, you know, today just showed that, you know, there's lots of ideas to be incorporated. And you know, as a you know, and part of it was that challenge. You know, Raina saying, "Well, what are you doing on X?" Well, you know, we'd left that as a, a different component. So, how do we apply an optimism lens to that? And if we come back to say Bill George at Harvard, you know, who wrote the book, you know, True North, when I asked him what makes him optimistic, he said, "Being surrounded by positive people, what a blessing." So, if we can use the sort of tools that Raina's talking about and that Rob talked about. Um, the one that starts with P, then, you know, we can make it easier for people to surround themselves with optimists at work. So 
I reckon there's a really good piece of work on that, Irena, that we can follow up. So everyone, thanks so much. And I will report back to you after tomorrow about our physical presence uh, again in, in places. Catch you all. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Sleep well, Rod. Sleep well. <laughs>